Did you know that with over 21,000 tons of gold in our households, India has more gold than the World Bank reserves. And yet, we have won only 60 grams of gold in the Olympics. A total of just 10 gold medals in the last 123 years. Meet Neha Agarwal Sharma, who is working to change that. She is an ex-Olympian turned tireless advocate whose mission is to shape the future of India's athletic glory. Once an Olympian herself, Neha's fighting spirit and unwavering dedication led her to stand on the world's grandest stage, representing India with pride and grace. From the grit of training grounds to the thrill of competing on the Olympic podium, Neha's journey has been an embodiment of an athlete's pursuit of perfection. But Neha's story didn't just end with her athletic career. Instead, it marked a new chapter. A chapter committed to empowering a generation of Indian athletes to claim their rightful place atop the Olympic podium. Please welcome Neha Agarwal Sharma. Thank you, Neha. Thanks a ton for being here. Thanks, Captain. Thank you for having me. So, before we begin, let me ask, what is a girl from a typical Marwadi Baniya family uh, even venturing into sports? Where did it begin? Yeah, I think, uh, so uh, I come from a typical Marwari Baniya family and growing up, you know, I always saw, uh, I was the youngest in the entire, uh, you know, cousins and the white clan. I saw all my cousin sisters going to school, college, within the two kilometer radius of home. And then with one dream, which was to find the right husband for mm -hmm. them. They were married at about 18, 19, 20. And that was the biggest celebration in the entire family. Mm -hmm. That's what I saw all my life. And uh, here I was, I was so lucky to have a visionary father who put both me and my brother into sport. So I was four when I started uh, uh, doing skating actually in my school mm -hmm. uh, and uh, became the national champion in under six category wow. uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they used to have it back then. Uh, but my coach was from Kerala. He moved uh, back to uh, Kerala and, and you know, back in the day, right? It's not before the internet. Uh, so we did not Which know. Which year are we talking This about? was 96 is when you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, but the good thing was the other sport that the school promoters was table tennis mm -hmm. and I have an elder brother, uh, he, uh, he went there and uh, the school made it mandatory for kids from nursery to first standard to just go play in the local tournament that they used mm -hmm. to conduct. My brother won the silver medal in that tournament and my parents were so thrilled. Mm -hmm. And uh, that very next day they put both me and my brother into table tennis coaching. That's how it started. Absolutely hated the sport, uh, you know, when I first uh, joined uh, the coaching and I just used to go for training because I used to love spending time with my brother. So that's how the journey started. Mm -hmm. um, I still remember there was the Asian Junior Championships in Delhi mm -hmm. at that time, around that same time and um, the table on which the tournament, the finals was played. My father actually bought that table. It costed him 20,000 rupees Those at that days. time. The, the very same table. The very table. same table. Yeah. We did not have a color TV at home. We did not have a car at home. And uh, my father chose to buy, the buy table. a table for their And kids. not any table, that table. And not any table, <laughs> that table. And I'm asking him that, why did you do that? He said, maybe this will put them more confidence. This will bring them more determination that if this was the winning table and here mm -hmm. you're playing on. So, and I think back in the day, he made that sacrifice, right? And he came back home. I had grandparents at that time. I actually lied to my grandparents mm. because they were totally against me playing sport. Mm. So they lied. To, uh, to him and got the table home and I think that was really uh, the, the mark of my sporting journey uh, when, when you know, he got that table and that's how we started. Tell me your journey from the time you uh, started it and then started winning tournament after tournament after tournament and finally your journey right up to the Olympics. Yeah, uh, I think the number one I got lucky was because of my parents. Mm -hmm. And the second was I got a good coach early on who introduced me to a technique which was totally different. Uh, it was the long pimples rubber. Uh, that means it was defensive on the backhand side and attacking on the forehand. You'll have to explain that. So yeah. the racket so has got two sides. The racket has got two sides. On the backhand side, it is not the plain surface mm -hmm. that you it's generally those, see. Yeah, it's, it's got dots. Dot. So it's mm -hmm. called the inverted pimples. Mm -hmm. And when you play against 
against it, it gives the opposite spin okay. of what the uh, opponent, opponent is doing. Has. So if mm. you give me a top spin, mm. I'll give you a back spin. Okay. And playing with this technique, in I like to say it, it's an art. It's mm -hmm. not everyone's piece of cake. It is very rare. Uh, not many players have seen success and for whatever reason my coach thought that I should be playing with mm -hmm. this and we set on that journey. I, I think some of the things that you know worked well in my favour back in the day was that the one big thing is that um, I was very disciplined. Uh, I, I didn't really like the sport until I started winning. Mm -hmm. I don't think I had had the right physical uh, makeup for playing a, a, a physical sport like table tennis. And also it was not in my genes. I don't think I was the most talented player out there. Mm -hmm. But what I did well was I was very sincere. I worked hard and I, I just did what my coach asked me to. And in 2001, when I was about 12 years old, was when I won the national championship for the first time. Wow. And I stood on the podium and you know, that's where I got the realization that, oh my God, I, can I got that yeah winning mm. feeling. And after that, I really put my heart and soul into sport. Before that, I was just doing it because I was told to, but after that, I really put in my heart and soul. And um, we did, there was a lot of R&D which we had to do. After winning that uh, tournament, the chief national coach of the Indian senior team told me mm. that, Neha, you won it in the juniors, but if you have to make it big in the seniors and want to play for India at the Olympics, you might want to rethink. I don't think you'll be able to make it big with this technique. Mm -hmm. You know, my coach, my parents, we were all very determined. Uh, and, and again, you know, this is not the era of internet I'm talking about. So we did not have the knowledge. Mm -hmm. But I think what we had was the determination. There was a lot of ups and downs. In 2006, uh, I became number one in the country. And uh, in 2007, I continued to do that. And uh, 2008, at the Olympic qualification tournament, I beat two of uh, the senior other seniors who were favored to, mm -hmm. to go for that mm -hmm. and uh, qualified for the Olympics. I was only 18. And you know, very funnily, I, I made the phone call back home. And no, no, where, where, hang on, hang on. Where were you when you were told that you were qualified? Yeah, this was in Hong Kong in okay. March 2008. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is an Olympic qualification tournament. So I won that for mm -hmm. uh, the, the South uh, uh, so South Asian quota. And, uh, you know, when I called my uh, coach and my father back home and I said, uh, you know, I've qualified. And they said, Acha, very good. Mm. Aajau ghar. Aajau ghar. You know, that's all. That's I mean, <laughs> we did not even know that, uh, you know, it's such it a is big deal. A, such a big deal. It mm. was... Uh, for the very first time from Delhi, somebody was playing at the Olympics in, in table tennis and we never imagined that somebody, you know, who, uh, who rarely knew sport uh, from a Banya family could do that. So uh, back, uh, you know, re rewinding all of that, when you put into perspective, it uh, does feel like an achievement and, um, you know, obviously at the Olympics was just fantastic. I think Wait, before you go there. Uh all of us watch uh, athletes climbing on that podium, getting that medal, and none of them see what goes into making that happen. So I want to know what's a typical day in the life of an athlete who is preparing to fight the Olympics. Yeah. What time does it begin? And of course, this is all happening while you're studying also. You have to go to school. You have to at least pass the grades, if not top the school. So tell me about that. What is your typical, what is the typical day of an athlete well before they even make it to nationals, international and finally the Olympics. What does it involve? Yeah, so my uh, typical day was I used to wake up at 4.30 a.m. Uh, uh, because at sharp at 5.30, I had to report for training. Mm -hmm. Okay, and like you said, I was in school, uh, so I had to go to school as well. So wake up at 4.30, get ready by 4.45. From 4.45 till 5.20, I had to do my warm-up and be ready because my coach used to come at sharp at 5.25. Have to explain the warm-up. What are the warm-up involved? Yeah, so uh, basically getting your body ready uh, to start the training, right? So that includes uh, getting up, getting stretches done. Then you do, uh, you know, your heart rate up. So mm. you're uh, running, you do your drills. Then you go on the table, you're doing shadow practice. Mm. Then we also used to have a iron racket, which mm. is so about weight. two way, yeah, mm. kgs heavier than your regular mm. racket. Mm. So you do your shadow practices with the iron racket mm. and mm. all these the coach has told you the day before mm. to uh, prepare and mm. do it mm. uh, and because when you come on the table right mm. you have to have 
uh, you know, you have to be sweaty and you have to be ready to, mm, to do play, the, uh, play, you know, drills train. that you have to. So mm. uh, that will take at least half an hour for you, for your body to warm up. And, you know, we're in Delhi, right? So mm. uh, aapki, uh, it's winters, yeah, you know, you have to <laughs> sweat it out more. Mm. And, and I think my coach also was so passionate, you know. I still remember that uh, be it summers, be it winter, be it monsoon, he was never late. Right, we were training on mm. that table at home, mm. right? Mm. He would never be a minute late. Mm. And that also pushed me, mm. right, to be there and be ready for the training. So that's what, so the training started sharp then at 5.30. 5.30 to 7, we would train. And then 7.15, my bus used to come. So between 7 and 7.15, I had to change, I had to get ready. I had to quickly just have mm. something, go to the bus stop and mm. catch the bus. Mm. And then go to school, come back and then from 3 to 6.30, again, was training, come back home, do... 3 to 6.30, that's 3, to three and, six and a half 30. hours. Yeah, hmm. 3 and a half hours. Uh, come back home, uh, you know, finish your uh, homework that you got from school and then go back, uh, uh, go to bed till 8.30. And this happens day after day after day Day and after day out, day and day out. For months and years before you get to the Olympics. Months and years and, you know, uh, uh, my, my I, I never had any friends in school, right? I never used to go for any birthday parties. Uh, I did not have a social life. Uh, I mean, my relatives would be like, ye sara din sif khelti rehti hai, aati nahi hai, malab, kaisi ladki hai, you know? Hmm. You, because as an athlete, you have to be so focused and it, they say, right, it takes 10,000 hours to perfect hmm. a skill. Hmm. And how do you put in those 10,000 hmm. hours? And hmm. That is what defines you from somebody uh, of your age who's doing better. They would have practiced don't, those 10,000 hours mm. much earlier than mm. you have mm. done. Mm. So that's kind of the race you're also fighting against, mm. right? And uh, I think because we did that focused training in the morning every single day, that really laid a foundation on the right technique mm -hmm. that uh, we had to use. Mm -hmm. Of course, later when we used to go for the national camps, uh, the training was much longer. We would practice about two and a half to three hours, uh, uh, three hours in the morning, similar hours in the evening. There is a one hour of physical work and then there is stretching. You have to rest, recover, you have to eat well. So there's a lot that happens, uh, goes, uh, you know, uh, when you're training for the Olympics. No, but that's, I, I mean, the reason why I asked you that question is because, like I said, you know, everyone sees the person receiving the award. But very, very, very few people realize the effort that has to go in, the rigor and the effort and sacrifices, letting go of many, many other things which has to go in. And that's true not just for sports. It's pretty much true for any kind of achievement. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think for any kind of achievement in life, for any uh, sphere that you're in, right, be it in education, be it an entrepreneur, be it in service, be it in sports, right, you have to put in those hours. Mm. and. Until you sacrifice something, you will not be able to see the shining product that you actually get it right at the end of the day. So, and with sport, it is right that they say that uh, the medal at the Olympics is not won when a billion people are watching you on that day. Mm. It's mm. won at every single day at 5.30 a.m. in the morning when nobody's, nobody's watching, watching you. you. Mm. And uh, what pains me, you know, that it doesn't matter how the previous day was. You won, you lost. Every day you have to come back as a fresh athlete. You have to come back with the right, right mindset. You have to put back the success, the defeat on the back burner. And today is a different day. You have to show up. And uh, that is something which is the training gives you as a young, uh, you know, as, as a young kid. If it gives you that sort of a training, it really prepares you for success in later on in the years as well. Which I feel the four walls of the classroom does not. Right, the sort of rigor that is required and the hard work that is required to uh, train to become an athlete is, is absolutely different. Let's talk about defeat. So you go represent this country in the Olympics, the only uh, uh, woman to do that. And uh, tell me about that story when you go to the Olympics and you're facing an opponent whom you have beaten earlier. 
Yeah, I mean, um, you know, at the Olympics, uh, it's it's obviously the biggest honor of my life, right? I still recall uh, the opening ceremony, uh, right? We were uh, 56 people. Uh, the the contingent was of 56. This is which year? 2008 Eight. in Beijing. Beijing. And uh, the opening ceremony Bird's was Nest. in the Bird's Nest Stadium, mm. right? And uh, when you're uh, representing uh, the nation, there's a parade of uh, mm. nations, right? That mm. we all see. And uh, you know, it was such an honor because I was clad in a nice Nice green sari. Colonel Rajavasan Singh Rathor was the flag bearer, and mm. you know when the entire contingent walks into the stadium, mm. and uh, you take that walk mm. around, all you can see is flashes of camera lights. Mm. Right? Mm. There is cheer. There is flashes. There is chatter. Uh, you know there are camera lights on you, and inside, what's going on for yeah. an athlete? Right? Tell me that. It's all those hours and hours of practice, it is all that sacrifice you made, right? It is the birthday parties you missed, it's the no friends you had, it's uh, the blood, the sweat, uh, the tears, the defeats, all of that then comes into perspective and then it feels worth it. Mm. I pinched myself not once but twice that Am yeah, I really, yeah. I made it, right? Mm. Something mm. I had been dreaming mm. since the last eight years and today mm. I've made it. Mm. And and really, you know, it, it feels... Uh, it's, it's and you a were not a hot pride. favorite to make it there. I was not the, the favorite to make it. Two of uh, my, my other seniors were more favored uh, to make it back then. And, and that's when I was only 18, one of the youngest ever Olympians uh, in, in India. Mm. Um, so it was uh, sort of a dream for me to be there. And uh, and uh, when I came for my match, you know, it was against this Australian Chinese whom Who? I had beaten two months before at the World Championship. Okay. So I and, went, and was that a tough match when you beat her in the World Championship? It was. Uh, it was three one victory. Mm -hmm. So, so comfortable was, victory. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I and you know when I was visualizing about my match and thinking about it, I was pretty confident that I'll be able to do it. Um, little did I know that the stage of the Olympics is so different. Um, I went into the match and... Um, tell, tell me the moments before you're going into the match. When you're in the yeah. dressing room, you're getting ready, your name is being called out. What's happening inside you? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, your heart is racing uh, mm. because there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different perspective, I would say, around the Olympics. One is it's once in four years. Yes. Very few Indians actually make it. Mm. The only women, you know a billion people are watching back, right? Like there are, my friends are telling, I was in St. Stephen's College, they put up a big screen to watch my match over mm. there. You mm. know, everyone's awaiting uh, for, for you. The, suddenly media is writing about you, mm. right? Something which you never experienced mm. in the past. So there's so much expectations that come with it. And, you know, there's a stat which says that for 60% of the athletes, they play Olympics only once in their lifetime. Mm. Mm. So you know that maybe this moment might never, never come, come back again. again. Mm. So you want to give it at all. Mm. Um, so there's so much going on, and of course, you know, you're talking, uh, you're thinking about your uh, opponent and the strategy and what you're going to play. You're re reviving the match you played the last time and thinking what you need to do this time better. And when they call, uh, you know, there's a call before they call your uh, name, and you have to walk into uh, the stadium and. This is table tennis happening in China. China. So this the, is like the, cricket the, the, happening the, in, in India, yeah, yeah. Uh, right? Uh, there are about ten thousand people in the in the stadium. And your opponent is also Chinese. Your op opponent is also uh, Chinese, although so from, there's a home uh, crowd this, advantage. Like, you know, you you win a uh, point. There's like ooh, the, uh, oh, the, the yeah, crowd is. The, the crowd is kind of favoring them, right? Mm. And you you uh, you lose a point. They're kind of uh, happy, mm. and you know you're playing against that sort of environment. So. Uh, there's so much pressure that comes in and, and I still remember my hands were shaking. I, I can never forget that feeling. And um, uh, it was it was 2-1, uh, it was almost neck to neck and uh, from there uh, the match slipped away. And um, uh, I don't think it no, was... No, no, I, I want to stay there. So at what moment in the match did you know it's slipping away? It was 1-2 uh, uh, in her favour and I think it was about 5-6 uh, when I called for a timeout. And uh, I went back on, on, on the coach's chair and I said, Ki, uh, you know, I'm really confused. Like, I feel a lot of pressure. This is a very different opponent than what she was when I played ago. her. Yeah, 60 days ago. It's just 60 days ago. Mm. And what changed? Mm. 
not that she became a better player mm. in 60 mm. days mm. it was just the mind mm. right she was obviously much older to me she was, she was much, more experienced yeah much more experienced she was How i old think was she? she was i think about 8 to 10 years older okay. to me so yeah i was only 18 mm. she was she had already played the olympics twice 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 mm. and for me it was the very first experience mm. so mm. um i could feel the pressure and i could i knew that i am not my best today mm. and uh, uh, you know you uh, when you're not at your best right you're not moving the right way you mm. know you're not uh, you turn and hit shots you're not turning as quick mm. your serves are not effective mm. as it would be mm. five minutes later you take me outside of uh, uh, the, i yeah. would yeah. you know be the same neha that i was 60 mm. days before mm. <laughs> right mm. so for at the olympics the stakes are so high and i think if only i had the right preparation not obviously in terms of the technique and the physical uh, uh, fitness but more importantly the mental makeup right i think that was lacking mm. and uh, i think that kind of stayed i know the now there are a lot of uh, emphasis on sports psychology and all of that stuff did we have it back then when you were not at all i think i mean still till today uh, you know when you talk about going to a psychologist or seeing a therapist uh, it's a taboo mm. right back in the, the day now i'm talking 15 years back right i mean that time there was no concept your coach was your nutritionist your fitness trainer your uh, physiotherapist Counselor, your psycho psycho catrice psychologist your driver like everything right was that one coach or your parents so we did not have a team which now the athletes do have at least the elite athletes in india do have so mm. the concept was non existent in fact it always felt ki aap mein kuch problem hai mm. if you know you want to uh, kind of see if you want somebody. to seek help yeah to make your mind robust then there is something wrong with you yeah mm. and you know sports psychology is is two ways one is obviously counseling which kind of helps you in healing and those things but second is also performance enhancement mm. 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 we forget that part mm. and i would say today in the country there are only handful of good sports psychologists so that's one area we're still lacking so we come back the to the country. match you know it's slipping away you called for half uh, uh, time out and now your coach gives you some advice hopefully and sends you back in what's your state now i knew it was slipping away mm. because uh, you know when you've you've been on the battlefield mm. right mm. you know if you're not at your best your mm. mind's not there mm. um, and there you don't have an option mm. right you have to obviously you have to continue you, yeah. you have to mm. continue you have to give it your all mm. but on that day my best was not enough good enough mm. she was better. a much better player mm. on that very day mm. and uh, i mean i cried i cried straight for 7 days so you got beaten and then you have that walk back to your dressing room i want to hear what you felt at that time i would say it's it's like a walk of shame you know because um, there is so much that is that goes in that build up and in 20 30 minutes everything's over hmm. right and all those dreams and all that you think about so maybe could have at happened. 18 years the saddest moment of your life oh for i mean uh, we can talk about more but at that very age at that point 100% and think about it right you are carrying your nation's flag at the olympics and you let not yourself down mm. but you let your country down mm. and that's the sort of feeling that comes in and at 18 for a young girl to go through that uh, obviously it makes you hard, uh, tougher when you experience something like this but at that very at that moment time, it breaks you your don't heart. feel tough at all i mean mm. i didn't feel like talking to anyone when i walked back i was already in tears i felt i i let everyone down uh, i i i was like i'm not going to play again uh, you know Ever. probably i'm I not i want touch a racket again yeah mm. probably i'm i don't deserve this i'm mm. not worth of uh, worth this and uh, how would i face my people back home how would i okay after the match you have to directly do interviews with mm. the media mm. Mm. you know you start thinking what what will what the media ask you mm. you have to every player has to go through that so you have to think about what you are going to talk in the media and uh, these are very real uh, feelings which is it's it's scary to to be doing that at that young age um, and again you're alone at that time you have to pull yourself together and put up a okay Brave face, face. Mm. and uh, go go through uh, that that tough journey mm. so so you came back and then 
a journey began where you started sliding down. Yeah, so I came back and uh, you know they say that uh, when uh, uh, it, it's, it's one thing to be at the top but to maintain the top it takes a different training altogether. Mm. So I come back and then uh, suddenly I start losing in the pre quarterfinals. I, I mean, I'm losing to players uh, who are, uh, you know, 20, 30 spots uh, behind me. And, uh, you know, I lose straight uh, in, in, in pre-quarters in the first round. And something I've never experienced before. Because from 2001 till 2006, straight, I played the finals of the national championships mm. straight. Hmm. So I was, I mean, one used of... Used to winning. Yeah. And hmm. suddenly you're, you're seeing now yourself you're being lose. you're to lose. And, um, uh, you know, you start wondering what's going wrong. Hmm. Uh, and uh, everybody started blaming the technique. Hmm. Uh, you know, the coach back said, hmm. you know, The technique was bad. I, I, I told you. Hmm. you, you uh, and many people started saying that probably it was fluke. Hmm. To, to, that victory was a fluke. Yeah, yeah. To, hmm. and to go to the Olympics was a fluke. Hmm. Um, and uh, I, I remember there was this one match where I was leading 3-0 uh, and I lost from there 4-3 in the first round to an opponent I've never ever lost to. Uh, in one of the international tournaments, I remember I lost, uh, I, I lost to this uh, player from Netherlands and one game was on zero. And I cannot tell you how much it can hurt for somebody who's always had a graph went going up, mm. right? I had never seen uh, defeat at that level. Mm. 2010 Commonwealth Games uh, were coming and uh, I missed the spot in the Indian team. I was the second reserve. And I've been dreaming of that tournament since 2001. Um, uh, I mean, I put up a brave face, but uh, uh, really, I lost so much belief by then. Uh, and mind you, this is 19, 20, 21, like the peak years, the prime years mm, of your mm, life. Mm, mm. I lost so much belief that I changed the technique, the very mm. technique that made me who I was. Mm. And it, it just, I kept losing, 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 losing so much that I remember in one of the tournaments, I actually attempted to harm myself. It, it was so, you know, they, they say that when you win, you win in, in front of the entire nation. But when you lose, you also they lose, lose in front of a crowd. Mm. And it was so humiliating for me that I could not take it. And I had to really pull myself uh, back into peace together uh, to, to, you know, prove, mostly to prove that it was not a fluke, mm. right? Um, so 2009 to 2000. 12 actually, I was not in the Indian team. Uh, I got back into the top eight, but I never won a single tournament. I did not make it to the 2012 uh, Olympics, of course. And, um, but what I was doing is I was still working. Uh, you know, I, I changed coaches also in between. I moved to a different city. And the sort of hard work I did at that time, I think, uh, you know, people ask me that, uh, you know, was, a, was it a mistake to change your technique? But mm. I think the experience that gave me, I've never worked so hard in my entire life. I was training three sessions in a day apart from one physical session, you know, putting in all the might that you could, doing video analysis, you know, working with the psychologist to eliminate fear from your head. Because when you lose so much, there's a lot of fear that comes in. So working on various aspects to fill in the gaps that were there. Um, and in January of 2013, uh, you know, I finally won the national championships mm. in, and I was unbeaten in the team's uh, event. And really that was my moment of pride. I made it back to the Indian team. And, um, you know, when you go to the, uh, make it to the team, you get blazer. your uh, blazer. blazer. Mm. And I still remember the first thing I did was I took the blazer and wore it and I clicked a picture in front of my trophy cabinet because until then I was feeling so naked, right? You feel that something's wrong, something's not stripped. there. Mm. You've been stripped of all of that. And mm. that was your honor 
you know your moment of pride that you kind of get it made it back again yeah you've you've made it back so for me if you ask me what's been the most proudest moment was more than playing for india at the olympics was actually making that comeback and uh, you know bringing that honor back because it was so brutal that uh, you know i did not want to play at all i didn't want to uh, face anyone i was also a decent student so and i was you know in that 2021 age the banya uh, mentality came back ki jaldi se padhai kar lo and then you know probably get married and you know choose a different life hmm. um but i chose to stay hmm. because i really wanted to prove to yourself want- basically yeah of course to yourself because how do you sleep peacefully at night right if you don't know that you've not given your 100% and you, once you know you've given your 100% and you've made it big you know you've proved everyone wrong is that when you kind of feel satisfied and there've been so many hurdles i remember in 2013 i had a back injury and for 10 days i could not find the right doctor who could diagnose that what was wrong. it that had happened mm. you know the every other doctor we went was said take bed rest and you know the commonwealth games were coming i had to be you know selection was coming and i'm like where do i go and in the life of an elite athlete every second matters yes yes right mm-hmm. it cannot be you taking you can't take 10 days off before and <laughs> you have to have the right recovery the right mindset and to know how to uh, you know uh, recover from that horrendous injury and it it was so bad that till date it it gives me troubles this is you know about 10 years back now so um i think that sort of left a lot of dent in my heart that it was not that i was not working hard it was not that i was you know doing something wrong i think the system never geared us to work as much and in similar fashion as what the best in the world were doing mm. what the chinese were doing what the japanese were mm. doing what uh, the koreans were doing who were the top uh, countries in 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 the game. Mm. yeah so by the time i i played at the 2014 asian games i remember we played the quarter finals against singapore and we played a good close match we lost that match and we were very happy that you gave a good fight we gave a good fight and mm. we were happy and i'm like what like are we still not dreaming big mm. we still are not going into a tournament as a champion mm. we are still not going there to win medals mm. and it will not happen until you have solid preparation mm. right belief comes from that belief if comes from know, training and if you reason. know that mm. if you've not done the right work mm. uh when you're on the field mm. you just know that you know you, you, you won't know be good enough and mm. we always knew that and i think over those uh, from then to now if you ask me the one thing that has changed is that belief today when our athletes walk on that court mm. in that stadium mm. they walk with honor with pride with that belief in their hearts and minds that they go as winners as champions that they can beat anyone that's there uh you know up there and i think that was the belief that we never had back then so you decided after playing the game that you're going to help other people get that belief and you moved into this new avatar so tell us about that yeah so after the 2014 asian games uh, i chose to retire and uh, you know for me uh, i i think i was a big india believer to me it mattered a lot that why isn't india winning right if if we would win medals in any other uh, sport i would cry right and uh, it it really pained that uh, in in my personal journey that i i knew that i could have been a better athlete mm. so um i said that my life would be better served if uh, you know i could help the next generation and basically ensure that the mistakes that were made during our career are not repeated in the next generation mm-hmm. so i retired uh, i then did my masters in sports management from columbia university in new york uh, worked for a couple of years uh, uh, abroad in the united states olympic committee at the international table tennis federation uh, to learn the other side of sport mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then uh, now since the last 6 years uh, i work for an organization called olympic gold quest 
Best, where uh, our mission is to help Indian athletes win Olympic and Paralympic gold medals. And um, uh, uh, very proud to say that uh, in the last uh, three Olympics, uh, India has won a total of 15 medals. And we've supported the training of nine of those 15 wow. medal winners uh, in, in the last uh, three Olympics. And, um, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, they say that uh, it, it takes just six grams of gold, gold. to lift the worth of a nation. nation. And uh, really, it's those six grams of gold that we all strive for. All, all of us, right? There are multiple folks in the ecosystem that we work towards. I think the government has done a fantastic job in the last uh, two Olympic cycles now, uh, put processes, structures in place. I think now the athletes are um, being funded having structures and the right processes, the ecosystem that we did not have, right? Mm, mm. From physiotherapists to nutritionists to mental trainers, fitness trainers, you know, uh, training to go abroad and uh, compete. These things and the planning, right? What tournaments you need to play? What what are the right steps to do? Uh, what is a off-season training session look like? Mm. You know, how do you tra train during a competition uh, season? You know, all of these things that are needed uh, for our athletes. Mm. I think the the system is now in place. Uh, in place. Something. So which compared to this, you were just winging it. You were just making it up as you went along. Yeah, I think uh, back then it was a lot uh, to do as an individual effort. Mm. Uh, but now I do believe that tides uh, have changed because back then we did not have any um, guidance as well. I think that period from 2009 to uh, 12 when I didn't do well uh, was also a big factor that I did not have any mentor. You know, I also look back, I did not have any role model, especially I did not have any female role model. Mm, mm, because mm. Our, there were no other girls who were out there and doing well. How do you, how do you see a vision, right, as a young athlete? I mean, my role model was uh, Sharat Kamal, who was just my uh, uh, colleague mm -hmm, uh, in the mm -hmm. men's, who, who's, who's winning medals at the Commonwealth Games. So, but for our young girls, today we have a PV Sindhu. We have a Saina Nehwal, we have a MC Mary Com, we have a Meera Bai Chanu who've all won, broken, you know, the glass, the, the glass ceiling, ceiling yeah. uh, to win medals uh, at the Olympics uh, for India. So, I think the the kids of today are are better off with these role models. And I think if we can make many more such champion role model, and especially for our young girls, mm. uh, you know, India, uh, our young kids just need that belief. Uh, that if they did it, I too I can, can also do, do it. it. And they need the systems to support that. And they need the system. A couple of last questions. One, we, we spoke about it uh, when we were preparing for the interview, that uh, uh, why does a nation which is uh, still struggling with, uh, you know, a lot of uh, economic uh, poverty and uh, why should a nation like uh, us even participate in Olympics sports? And you gave a brilliant answer there that there are three reasons why yeah. every country and every individual, every citizen should be encouraged to play sports. So Yeah, I think... The, the biggest reason is, as a country, if it really lifts your morale, mm. right? When today a Neera Chopra mm. goes and wins the gold there, you and I and every single Indian citizen mm. feels pride, right? When you step outside mm. of the country and say, yes, we've also won medals. Mm. I, I think it just lifts everyone's morale, not just in sports, but even in their daily life. In daily life. they were having a bad day. I, I still remember I was in France the day they won the World Cup. Eight, and, and France, the, the earlier one, not the three. And they were going through a very bad patch at that time, economically. And the whole country just came out. It almost felt as the country just it had a resurgence. It lifts spirit, yeah. It lifts your spirit. It mm. brings so much pride to the country. Uh, you know, also the, the story of the women's hockey team. Mm, mm. Uh, they did not win a medal, but they finished fourth. And, uh, you know, those girls celebrating and cheering uh, uh, on the TV screens, right? When you see uh, our, our young girls, you see a Mirabai Chanu, uh, she, she lifted 115 kilos in clean and jerk, won the first medal for the country at the Tokyo Olympics uh, in 2021. Uh, it really lifted uh, the spirit of the entire country. She mm. won the... It's a metaphor. Uh, it, she lifted the weight of the country. It, it totally sense. did. Yeah. So I think that is the number one reason, uh, you know, sport is critical. I think the number two reason is uh, really the health of the country. Every single rupee you put into sport 
you save 10 rupees in healthcare right and physical and mental health mm, of the mm, nation mm. right uh, obviously your kids will be much more healthier much more fitter uh, better mental health because you know you're going out you're engaged in fitness activities and for lifetime mm. you know once an athlete is always Usually. an athlete mm, mm. And that individual, be it a boy or a girl, will also improve inspire. the ecosystem mm. around mm. them, mm. right? They mm. also inspire their immediate communities to be healthier. And I think as a nation, health is one of the biggest pressing problems that yep. we have. Yep. Yep. And mm. sport can really help solve that. Of course, in the long run, uh, it can totally do that. And I think the third one, uh, which I, you know, absolutely love and I tell everyone that, uh, uh, you know, the Battle of Waterloo was not won there. It was won in the fields of, playing fields of Eton, mm -hmm. right? What that means is that it really builds character. It tells you how to play as a team. Uh, you know, it builds confidence. It tells you how to handle success, but it also teaches you how to manage defeat and how to pull yourself mm -hmm. out of that defeat. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are the traits, right? Something I believe that the four walls of your classroom will never teach you. If you're out in the field, not everybody has to go play the Olympics. Mm -hmm. But when our kids of the ages of 11 to 19 years, if they've had that experience of sport, to play in a team environment, to you know be that individual mm -hmm. who can work with uh, various other team members, irrespective mm -hmm. of race, religion, uh, you know where you come from, economic status. Mm -hmm. You know you come together as a team. Mm -hmm. That sort of learning that individual will take with him or her in her in in you know their entire uh, future careers as mm -hmm. well. And um, you know I'm a product of sport. Um, I, I love when our girls play sport. I think in any case, uh, girls and women, um, not only in India, across the world, have to, uh, you know, just go through so much bias, so yep. much mm. struggle just as being women. And I think the experience of sport can bring so much leadership. It can bring in that confidence that I can fight through this. And I think for me, I just take that learning back whenever mm. I face any obstacles in my life. That if I could come back from that, that defeat, yeah. mm. um, I just go back to that experience. No, mm. I can do it, um, can you know, uh, today as well. And, and you know, you just become role models for, um, uh, for your community. It gives me so much pride that now those my other uh, cousin sisters are putting their daughters into sport. Wow. You know, and they're ensuring that they mm. have that experience. And uh, that is something which is, you know, fulfilling uh, to me. You know, it's, uh, we were talking about it earlier also. It's an irony that uh, despite all of this, a large number of Indian medals come from individual sports and not yet from team sports. And my sense is that's largely happening because while there are some parents, your mother is sitting here in the studio, there are some parents who, you know, your father, who put that, uh, stick their neck out. As institutions, as schools, as colleges, I don't think sports is that important even now. And that is an irony, uh, especially now, because if you look at the typical education cycle of children, for 18 years in their life, they're taught first to hide their creation and then to create. And after 18 years, they're told to go out and collaborate. And that's really, uh, really a tough one. And that's why I think Indians do very well, not just in sports, but in every other field, they do very, very well individually. But when it comes to a team, there is still a lot of work to be done. And I think the work that you're doing in uh, inspiring more people to, uh, you know, sort of uh, aim for that is, uh, tell me uh, something about this uh, para, para athletes as well. I mean, yeah. for an able-bodied person, if it is so tough, what would be the mental strength required for a differently abled athlete? Yeah. Even imagine that he or she can be an athlete. Yeah, yeah. Now I've, uh, through my work now, I've got the fortune to work with uh, several para-athletes and uh, uh, one is it, it humbles you a lot when you work with them mm. because uh, you, you see uh, from your, your eyes uh, already several challenges that life has posed to them and 
when they go get up at 5:30 am in the morning and yeah. do the training that is needed to i think in simple terms you have no room to complain yeah. it really humbles you and puts life into perspective mm. it really gives you a sense that uh, hey uh, maybe what you thought was an issue not probably a, not, yes, not right so it it really puts life into perspective and mm. uh, for me it's just been such a humbling journey um, you know i i i want to uh, uh, share the story so so uh, uh there is this uh, para table tennis player her name is uh, sonal patel she won the uh, bronze medal at the birmingham commonwealth mm -hmm. games in 2022 and uh, when she came back and uh, you know we were talking uh, first as we cried uh, buckets of tears because uh, she was not the favored one mm -hmm. to win a medal uh, she is a wheelchair bound uh, para table tennis player and uh, in para sports you have various categories mm -hmm. based on the severity of yeah, your good. disability mm -hmm. she was up against uh, at the commonwealth games they had clubbed all the uh, wheelchair categories mm -hmm. she was the most severely disabled wheelchair person there and she beat three of the players who were less severely yeah. disabled than mm -hmm. her mm -hmm. and she won the uh, bronze medal mm -hmm. she came back and i asked her sonal how did you do this and uh, you know uh, she just said ki ma'am mere mein jo wo jazba aa gaya jo belief aa gaya with now the support that i am able to get she says ki main apna god ko thank you bolti hu ki aapne mujhe disable banaya mm. imagine somebody saying that and asked her why do you say that mm. she's like because i come from a small uh, village near ahmedabad if not for sport मेरी जल्दी से शादी गई होती और बच्चे हो गए होते एंड आई वुड बी यू नो जस्ट अनदर पर्सन लिविंग अ नॉर्मल लाइफ एंड टुडे यू नो आई वन अ मेडल फॉर इंडिया दिस अ लॉर्ड ऑफ प्राइड शी हैज़ अ जॉब शी इज़ द हाईएस्ट अर्निंग मेंबर ऑफ अ फैमिली एंड शी टेक्स प्राइड दैट आई गॉट टू मीट आर आर पी एम नरेंद्र मोदी जी एंड शी इज़ द ओनली वन इन अर एंटायर गाँव हुज डन दैट सो सी द प्राइड एंड द ऑनर दैट that uh, uh person has uh what sport has done to them and uh, really it it's it's our uh, indeed a big pleasure to be working with them so it's my big hats off to these para athletes because if they can go get up every day you really have no <laughs> rooms to complain like and they inspire you have us you have no room to complain you don't you have, have no any room, room to complain they inspire mm. us a lot and they're not not just all there's so many such other para athletes in our country and i tell you watch out for next year's paris uh, uh, games our para athletes will win many more medals than our olympic athletes wow now thanks a ton for coming here and thanks a ton for telling us what it takes to lift 6 grams of gold thank you very much thank you so much